Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy, and I'm joined as usual by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? I'm doing well, Cass. How are you? I'm doing all right. We have a few crazy updates. I mean, not that crazy in the world of cryptocurrency. Um, two uh, $100 million hacks, one for the Binance Smart Chain and the other being about Mango Markets, which is a what, decentralized uh, trading platform, right? Um, so yeah, but, uh, just to, I'm going to quickly just let people, uh, help people understand what Binance Smart Chain is, um, cause that's going to be the first one that we're going to dive into. Um, Binance Smart Chain basically is a, uh, I don't know how to explain this as, but it's their DeFi platform. It's Binance's like supposed decentralized finance platform where you can build all these, uh, things on it. Um, but it isn't decentralized and, the reason we were able to find that out was because of this $100 million hack that ultimately could have been valued at roughly nearly half a billion or more. But because this, because the Binance Smart Chain, BSC, is not actually decentralized, um, well, they were able to halt the blockchain and stop the hacker from stealing all of that money. But Bennett, why don't you give a more detailed uh, explanation of what exactly went down? The technical details, I think, are not super important for how this hack was pulled off. They took advantage of the fact that uh, Binance Smart Chain was using an old pre-compiled version of a library that had a slight flaw in the way it verified proofs. And so because of that, they were able to withdraw things they weren't supposed to be able to. The piece of the infrastructure they were targeting is the Binance Smart Chain Token Hub, which is the bridge that allows for assets to be moved onto and off of the Binance Smart Chain. And so that was targeted like bridges are often targeted. We talked about the wormhole bridge hack a few months ago uh, where Jump ended up having to step in. And what happened in this case is the hacker was able to pretty quickly move, as you mentioned, about 100 million off of this chain onto other chains and start liquidating it. But uh, Binance was able to get a hold of all of the validators who run the Binance smart chain and convince them that it would be in there and the users of Binance smart chain's best interest for them to halt it until they could come up with a way to hard fork and return those assets to the bridge. Right. Um, so this makes you question the reality of I, I we've, we've discussed a lot of i don't know if we've discussed it here necessarily but there's a lot of claims about blockchains and decentralization in the cryptocurrency industry in general and a lot of times what you just have is like six people or eight people or 10 or 15 or whatever it is um and they try to claim this is decentralized that there's you know uh maybe there's some way of electing these nodes and who's going to run them um within the within the ecosystem and maybe it's by voting with through how many tokens you hold or whatever it may be but a lot of the times these things just are not decentralized and the reason they're not like one of the benefits of not being decentralized it turns out is for security reasons yeah it's certainly like it gave them the ability to stop this and I think that is more notable than some people have recognized, right? Because there have been comparisons made to like the Ethereum hard fork after the DAO hack or um, the Bitcoin overflow uh, rollback. But in both those cases, it was not possible to actually like halt the chain and stop it from progressing. Uh, in the case of Ethereum, a bunch of white hat hackers took advantage of the same vulnerability that the black hat hacker had taken advantage of, moved the funds to their own little child DAOs inside the DAO, and then they forked it away, removing the hacker's access to the part of Ethereum he stole here. Um, the difference here is that CZ was able to call up the validators or get in touch with the validators however he did and let them know hey we think it would be best if this chain no longer progressed until we figure this out is there any idea about who the hackers were or are yet i don't know that there is for the binance chain hack there is some other information for some of the other hacks like 
I was talking about the Dow hack, and that's from 2017, so it's not news. But earlier this year, Laura Shin, the host of Unchained, did figure out when she was publishing her book, Cryptopians, that uh, Toby Honish, the co-founder of 10X, was the Dow hacker. Yeah, 10X, which we don't need to get into, but also a really stupid, stupid, Another stupid Another 2017 concept. scam. Yeah. Do you think this will, over the course of any amount of, like, it, extended timeline besides just the moment of do you think this will have any real lasting effect on binance smart chain or on bnb or on binance in general who the fuck knows right binance smart chain doesn't make sense as a concept a centralized way to do DeFi. a chain that's this controlled doesn't serve a purpose. The only reason cryptocurrencies are ever useful is for censorship resistance. And we're showing here why this chain is not that meaningfully censorship resistant, right? And so the only reason it's ever existed is be as a way for people to profit from copycat schemes and like Ponzi schemes and these weird games and scams and stuff that propagate in this, uh, alternative chain, all the while driving value to BNB, the token that Binance created, right, that derives its value primarily from the efforts of Binance. And so what's it going to do to Binance chain? Why does Binance chain fucking exist? <laughs> I mean, what it does is shows any regulators who are looking at protocols on Binance chain and think, hey, that looks like a Ponzi scheme, or hey, that looks like you're offering unregistered margin trading. They can now say, so why don't you stop the chain and make them remove that? Because you just proved you can stop the chain and remove things. That's what you did. And so now you might have people asking you to do that. Laura Shin had CZ on her podcast. Uh, maybe it was two, three, four years ago, and that was when BNB had just begun, and she had specifically asked him, is is this a security? Right, right. So the, so the way I view it is basically, just because multiple people around the world have a view doesn't mean that we all agree. <laughs> so, uh, but there's, there's no legal definition that a certain coin, at least uh, Binance coin is not, at least not defined legally by anybody as a, as a, as a security. Uh, many people may think themselves, or there may be even a comment or opinion. It may or may not be. I, I can. I, I think for every person that you find that who, who thinks that way, I can, I can find more people who are not. I can find ten people who thinks otherwise. So I think it's a, it's a difference in opinion, but it's definitely not classified legally or uh, anywhere, as far as I know. And to be honest, even if it's classified legally in some countries, it's probably classified differently in other countries. And the whole discussion about whether a coin is a security or not. Uh, only came some within the last, I don't know, six months or so. Before that, there, was, there wasn't any discussion about whether a crypto coin or ERC-20 coin is or is not a security. Nobody cared. And he said no, but he couldn't explain how it wasn't a security. And you can hear her pushing back and being like, I don't know, I've spoken to a lot of lawyers, spoken to a lot of people about this, and they all say it sure looks, it looks like, it quacks like, and it, and everything about it seems to be a security. Uh, and he just pushed back and said no. So I think we're testing the limits of that with, with moves like this, uh, where you stop a hack from occurring by making some phone calls. One of the things, like, in the CFTC settlement against Ukidao recently that they made note of in the order was that B0X LLC had these admin keys that enabled them to stop the protocol and had used them, like, in this period before they handed those over to the DAO. And so, like, the ability to stop conducting the behavior is a thing that, like, we have seen considered in other cases, right? We've discussed BNB, BSC. We discussed CZ and this, but what about Mango Markets? This happened a couple days ago uh, as of recording. Um, Mango Markets, decentralized exchange, hacked for over $100 million or somewhere around $100 million. Um, what, 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 what happened here? I'm not sure this one's a hack. Okay. And it, it's really more of a market manipulation. Right. It's another one of those cases where they took advantage of how an oracle was programmed, ran up the price of an asset, and, in the, and then in this case, borrowed against that asset with the intention of basically letting them seize the worthless collateral. It's a little bit similar to how uh, Danny and Sifu were accused of cashing out of Wonderland, right, is taking, is basically manipulating the price of time up, taking out these debts against it, and then using those to liquidate with no intention of ever repaying because you don't want that collateral anymore. And so 
they didn't really do anything they weren't supposed to. They just made the markets briefly irrational and took advantage of that irrationality. Now, having said that, <laughs> afterwards, they are now um, going into the governance forums and trying to make proposals and negotiate with the members of the DAO on how much they should have to return to avoid criminal charges. Whether or not that's going to work out for them, especially since there is uh, people online claiming to have identified the person who did this hack, is less clear to me. But that is currently where we are at with the mango markets situation. What Bennett is saying here is that um, essentially by having these these tokens that this this lad stole, or not stole, but he made markets irrational, like... Uh, Ben was saying, we've seen a lot of this. There's like flash loan type situation, right? Like mm -hmm. um, this is similar. Yeah, so this isn't exactly a flash loan, but the the concept being like you take out a giant loan, move that money into some asset or whatever, uh, immediately profit from that position, and then pay back the loan, which is now probably valued of like a thousand times less than it was originally, and uh, you've made a bunch of money. It's it's taking advantage of the um, parameters of these different protocols and using concepts that are perceived as being good for efficient markets and making inefficient markets out of it. So that's what we saw. And what, what Bennett is saying is now that he controls all of these tokens, he's proposing things for the community to vote on where they pay him a certain amount of money so that he doesn't get in trouble, but also they get all their tokens back. Um, and this is a common, like, this is a common thing in decentralized finance. Again, you have, like, governance based on, which, I mean, wow, talk about going back to exactly the way things once were. Basically, if you have the most money, you get the most votes um, uh, most of the time. This is not, I, that's not every single DAO or, or DeFi protocol, but it certainly is most of them. Um, and, yeah, that's kind of uh, being fully taken advantage of right now. Um, which is a little bit funny. It's just a little bit silly. In the vein of it being a little bit silly, the Carl Stack Substack, Chris Brunette writing the piece, revealed that they had Discord messages from the person who had been planning this and then executed it. And so the attacker... <laughs> of the mango markets here, allegedly Avraham Eisenberg was not even being particularly cautious with their OPSEC or anything before engaging in this, describing like exactly what they were thinking about doing and what uh, effects it was going to have in a Discord. And then they did it, and now they're trying to negotiate to convince no one at the Dow to file criminal charges against them for manipulating it. Yeah, this is uh, similar to, though this time it was, yeah, it's the same. We've, we've spoken about this many times, it feels like. Almost every week we say, if you're going to do crime, try not to, like, chat it up with a bunch of people about it. Write it down in places where it can be used as evidence against you. Not to say that I want to help criminals, I don't. It's just, you guys are really dumb. And I feel like even this level of, hey, don't be this fucking dumb, I need to express to you. Um, because you're making everyone else's life very easy in trying to capture you and render justice. Unless you want to get caught, then maybe start taking more precautions. Um, <laughs> so that that's kind of, that's both of these, I, I guess at least the BSC uh, hacker, we don't know who that is yet. and um, and it it could be it could be anybody, and they they've done some level of decent, you know, operational security. But it is just, it, it is, it's laughable how often this happens that they do almost no, like, covering their foot tr their footprints and no due diligence. We talked about this, um, about North Korea and um, Virgil Griffith, where we specifically, who also is in the news again recently. Um, it just, all of it is, 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 is uh, absurd. I think total, I, I did the math and it was something like, $11 million a day has been lost in the cryptocurrency industry this year, if we average it out. And someone responded to that with like, 
And yet the credit card industry loses $70 billion a year. And I was like, you know, the beauty of, I didn't respond to him because I'm just exhausted by that argument. But the beauty of the, not to suggest that I'm a fan of credit cards and debit cards and banks, but the beauty of those things is that you can charge back, that you can get your money back and then it's not gone forever. That $11 million a day that's being lost in the decentralized finance industry is gone. And your odds of getting it back unless you're bringing criminal charges against somebody and you figure out exactly who it is and where they live, are minimal. So I think it's apples to oranges. It's not the same fair comparison. But yeah, I guess this is $200 million hacks in roughly four or five days separated from one another. It's getting to be a little bit taxing, I would say. It's get, It's almost like, even for critics and skeptics, you just go like, oh, so another $100 million hack. The numbers are almost like mind-numbing. The Mango Markets hacker, the one I was just referring to in the Discord when he was describing it, someone asked him uh, or said, like, unless it is highly illegal to be like, are you sure you want to do this? And his response was, are there rules these days? It's very tricky, though, and substantial capital risk. Like, are there rules these days? These things, these hacks are so commonplace and so mundane and rarely is it possible to definitively figure out who's responsible for them? And many times, like, the people who created these deeply flawed things, who caused these people to lose their assets and get hurt, are then immediately back doing another one. Yeah, well, we've seen that with Sifu uh, or Michael Pattern, um, Patron, yeah. as we've, we've, and, we've spoken about before. We've, I mean, Do Kwan, try, I, I was talking to Ben Munster, I forgot that Do Kwan even launched a Luna 2 right after. Um, and that still exists. And, you know, of course it does. Um, but he, he said, I don't remember who he was quoting, but the idea being that like after the failure of Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns, it would be as though those companies were like, oh, okay, so Lehman Brothers 1.0 failed and Bear Stearns 1.0 failed, but now we're going to start Bear Stearns 2.0. And like no one wants that. No one wants that. I think even more troubling than that is often when there's hacks of DeFi protocols, there are accusations, though again, they're very often challenging to prove that it's the developers themselves who end up often hacking these protocols, right? Is that they who, who, have been working on it. Who else could? Not Who else could? What, the developers of other protocols? Sure. Who also like read solidity and understand That's what I mean. These calls it's such and... a small pool. <laughs> it's such a small pool to begin yeah. with, you know? Yeah. And so like often it feels as though like they get it up to twenty million in total value locked or something, and then the protocol stalls out and their token starts free falling and no new deposits are coming in and it's slowly bleeding out. And then you'll see this protocol that you vaguely remember hearing about months and months ago, but not since, suddenly get hacked and the and the developers behind it disappear. And are they disappearing because they're ashamed? Maybe. Yeah, there's also been some questions recently about like criminality in the space. I think a lot of people are suggesting that it's easier to it's easier to push the narrative that like you were just experimenting with a protocol or whatever. Whether you're a criminal hacker or um whether you're a failure of a founder like Do Kwan, like how much it's almost like de decentralized finance makes this significantly more difficult to prove intent. Now, I'm not sure if that's actually true. I'm not suggesting necessarily that it is harder to prove intent because I think when I look at Do Kwan's case, for instance, it stinks of criminality. Um, and I don't think that the South Korean law enforcement agencies are going to be fooled by him being like, what? Just because I was the face of it and I made all the decisions, I'm not the one who should be prosecuted. And it's like, uh, actually, you should. So I don't think there's I, I, I don't think there's much of a case to be made for him. But maybe there is for some of this other stuff. I don't really know. Um, and, you know, we haven't heard much from 3AC. So is it is it easier to get away nowadays with um, with crime? I don't know the answer to that either. That Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Yeah, it's just, it's disappointing to see how commonplace these still are. And I think they're all the time. They hurt real people. It's very hard to get the people who did them and... Also, that's the other thing we hear a lot about is like that 
you know, not your keys, not your coin. If you're going to be doing stuff in this industry, like expect rug pulls, expect exit scams. These moments are going to happen. And I do like, it's hard for me to feel bad for the decision makers at Celsius for putting money with three AC, three arrows capital, like I, or for tether for becoming you know, equity investors in that. Like, I don't feel that bad for them. Do I feel bad for retail investors at Celsius though? Like, of course I do. People who, like normal people who put $50,000, their life savings uh, into Celsius, of course I feel bad for them. And I don't look at that and say like, well, I guess that's a lesson you're learning because I think that's a really shitty way of perceiving that concept. Like, shouldn't just flout it in front of retail traders. But then you wonder, like, how much, maybe Celsius had a lot of retail, but you wonder, like, how much of retail, and when we say retail, I guess I mean dumb retail, as in, and that's an unfair characterization. I say, I say dumb retail, meaning money that doesn't understand what it's necessarily investing in. So mango markets, like, I, like for Celsius, I know, I know there's a lot of, quote, dumb money because it's like, these people were assured a lot of, of, of a lot of things from Alex Mashinsky and the Celsius team. They were promised that this was, you know, that there were all this, like nothing could ever happen to, the, to these investments and these, these uh, lending schemes. There was nothing that could possibly go wrong. They were assured that repeatedly over and over and over again. That had plenty of dumb money. How much dumb money is in mango markets, right? Like, I don't really know. I doubt it's that, I doubt. There's types of dumb. <laughs> But I, yeah, sure. And and I guess my point, I guess my point being a bit here that perhaps, perhaps the dumb, the quote dumb money in, or let's say retail money, let's just say retail, let's go back to retail, let's call it retail money again. If we go back to, to retail money and we suggest that there's of this hundred million dollars that was moved off of mango markets, a uh, hundred million dollars worth of tokens that was moved off of mango markets. How many of the people involved actually are just like, yeah, well, we deserve this. Versus the people at Celsius, who I I would assume a lot of them are like, I never could have possibly seen this coming. Um, the people at Mango Markets are probably more informed about the cryptocurrency industry, right? They should be. I, it's I guess I mean it's hard to it's harder to use decentralized platforms in general. Yes, there's a higher barrier to entry. Anyone who's been trading on Mango Markets probably had a harder time getting started than someone depositing money into Celsius to earn a yield. And so you hope that that's going to filter out more of the most vulnerable. Right? This is part of why we got so upset about stable gains, which was like taking deposits from regular people and putting them directly into Anchor, right? that Y Combinator project, because it's removing any of that filter and making it so that potentially some of the most vulnerable end up exposed to these most dangerous projects. Because the issue is, there is a tiny bit of truth in the, it's an experiment, it's untested, this is new, and things might go wrong, right? The nature of crypto is that it's designed, once a transaction happens, to make it very hard to reverse that transaction. And so hacks are going to have larger consequences because of that detail, right? And because of that, when you're deploying new financial software, if you are not really confident about each and every piece of it, there are going to be more harmful hacks, exploits, and problems. That's just the nature of what cryptocurrency is. That part is true. The part that's less true is the, like, there's still often... Like in the case of Binance Smart Chain, the issue is they had not stayed up to date with updates to the uh, bridging system in Cosmos. They were using an older pre-compiled version and because they hadn't stayed up. It had this one vulnerability in it. And so or like and they running this chain that's like number three in total value locked behind Ethereum and Tron, they should be responsible enough to handle something like that. Right. And like in the case of Mango Markets, 
your Oracle design is known. You've published it and you can, to some extent, model it. The hacker even talked about like creating models and simulations of how the Oracle worked. The people who developed Mango Markets should have at least as much ability to simulate some of these more stressful situations for the protocol. And so there is still just a lot of stress testing and a lot of hardening that goes undone in crypto. Yeah, I mean, you've called out a lot of protocols for this. It's kind of crazy how much money gets invested in these concepts, uh, whether it's, I, I don't remember if it was Faye. There were a few, yeah, there's Faye. Faye was where the math didn't add up. Yeah, that, that, that was one. There was, uh, wasn't there another one more recently that you also called out that had bad math in the in the white paper? I feel like there's been two or three, um, but it doesn't matter. It might have been. There's, <laughs> th these people are able to collect hundreds of millions or billions of dollars from venture capital, hedge funds, angel investors um, with unchecked, flawed white papers. Uh, none of these venture capitalists know how to look at that stuff and read it. Like It, 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 was, it was Ethereum Prague Pout, Justin Sun's oh, right. proof of work fork of Ethereum. Their white paper was blank. They had no white paper. Right. <laughs> right. And so if we think about that, and, and maybe we're seeing the end of that now. Like maybe that was the easy money cryptocurrency industry like everything's exploding in value it's so easy you can literally have a blank white paper and collect hundreds of millions of dollars type of thing um maybe those days are now behind us hopefully um uh, but i doubt it i think these exploits and hacks are a great example of it's it's like more than not your keys not your coins it's showing the world that to really if you really want to be if you want to be on top of dealing with cryptocurrency and holding your coins all the time, you have to be like technically savvy. You have to code. You have to know how to read code. You have to know what changes are being made when and how they could affect you. Because ultimately, when a hundred million dollars or five hundred possibly million dollars could be moved off this chain, if you have a bunch of money in that, um, the value of your money could de depreciate significantly just because you didn't know about this hack, this exploit that could be taken advantage of. Um, so I think it's showing like another level of this that we've never really discussed, um, which is how difficult it it is to actually be protected, like in any of these coins, unless you are completely fluent when it comes to programming and, and coding and, and all of that. And I mean, the reality is I'm not I'm not that I couldn't. I couldn't possibly like confirm I'm trusting code if I buy Bitcoin, right? I'm not, I don't own Bitcoin to clarify everybody, but like when I bought Bitcoin in 2017, um, I read the white paper and thought it was cool. I looked at the charts and was like, oh, this is interesting. I had no conceptual re concept of like, yeah, I had no concept of like what is if I if I go deep into this code, will I find any errors or whatever? I couldn't have possibly told you that. Um, and I think that's most people who are involved in this industry. Um, and yeah, like I couldn't I couldn't still couldn't tell you what the what exactly happened with like the the bridge hack uh, for for Binance and Cosmo Binance chain uh, smart chain and Cosmos. I couldn't tell you what the flash loan type procedure was for Mango Markets and the governance tokens and all of this stuff. No. And that's like such a crazy, difficult nuance that most people are not going to be willing. It's like having to learn a language. It's like, be, you are your own bank, your own bank CEO, CTO, chief security officer, chief informatics officer. And you are like the head of the exchange monitoring and the, you're also the analyst for pricing all the assets. And uh, yeah, so that's just all you have fun. Yeah. Yeah, right. And I've, you know, people have purchased ledgers or hardware wallets. And these are things that you think are like, well, that's secure, right? But then it's like, then there's plenty of exploits in regard to those as well. And we've seen complete doxing uh, of, what well, was it Ledger? Um, Ledger leaked their whole customer base so, or got hacked or whatever. So I think you can't so hard to be again I, we talk about the niche use cases of cryptocurrency and i think those still exist but the niche keeps getting nichier and nichier <laughs> um <laughs> and not nietzsche or uh although maybe that too uh anyway
think that's going to do it. Uh, we just wandered into $200 million. I don't want to talk about how that happened. Uh, if you leave a like, subscribe, comment, we'll pass you some uh, BSC tokens, some Mango Market tokens. We'll throw them your way. Not, uh, I mean, we will throw cryptocurrency your way. I shouldn't have been that specific about which tokens we were going to give you. But we're very happy to have found this money and to be able to support ourselves. Um, if you can... If you can hit that like and uh, subscribe button, it'll make our lives easier because we can get rid of some of this cash that we've stumbled into, these hundreds of millions of dollars. Sorry, I'm getting word that I... Okay, Bennett, I won't... No problem, man. I won't mention that. We can cut that right out. You're going to have your own red notice soon. <laughs>